think about this for a second. The court is saying, if Homer Plessy sits next to a white person on that train car, he is depriving the white person the value of his or her property. Because they start with different property values, and simply by sitting next to the white person, that is the devaluing of the white person's property. On the other hand, what is the property value of Homer Plessy doing if he is allowed to sit next to the white person? It is actually being uh, enhanced, it's being increased, right? So the court argues that there is a something called social equality that the Constitution or laws cannot enforce and that that social equality or social inequality is based upon the notion of whiteness as property. Keep in mind that Justice Taney in the Dred Scott decision talked about the white man's republic. We're about 40 or 50 years past that at this point. The court, after slavery has ended, nonetheless comes to the conclusion that whites have more valuable property inherent in their being than non-whites, than certainly African Americans. The court says one other thing which I want to read here, uh, and this is about the power of the state to enact laws like this. So if you jump down to the very next paragraph, um, I want to just quickly read this. Uh, it says, Counsel for Plessy suggests that the same argument that will justify the state legislature in requiring railways to provide separate accommodations for the two races will also authorize them to require separate cars to be provided for people whose hair is of a certain color or who are aliens or who belong to certain nationalities or to enact laws requiring colored people to walk upon one side of the street and white people upon the other or requiring white men's houses to be painted white and colored men's black or other vehicles or business signs to be different colors upon the theory that one side of the street is as good as the other or that, the, that a house or vehicle of one is as good as one of another color. The reply to all of this is that every exercise of the police power, that is of state power, uh, must be reasonable and extend only to such laws that are enacted in good faith for the promotion of the public good. Listen to what the court says here that the reply to these ridiculous assertions about painting houses based upon skin color is that the, the state power has to be reasonable. So what we have here is the court saying that number one, there is a distinction between social and political equality. Number two, African Americans don't have the same value in their African Americanness as a white person does in his or her whiteness. And thirdly, such a law which d distinguishes and discriminates, or segregates rather, on the basis of race in a train car is reasonable by the standards of the late 19th century, and it is for the public good. Um, this is what I call, in, in a certain uh, context, the reasonableness of racism. And what you have to ask yourself as we go forward is, well, if the standard is reasonableness, then who gets to decide that? When does that standard change? Uh, how does it change? When does, it, um, when does the court act in a way that really reflects the change in what the reasonableness of that racist act might be? And I think that this is vital because as we turn next week to talk about the Brown v. Board case, you see a completely different viewpoint. It's not about the property of the white man being devalued in the interaction in the train car. But in the Brown case, it's about the damaged psyche of the African-American child because segregated schools leads to that damaged psyche. Um, and we'll get to that. But I want you to, to be clear about the, the logic and the decision of the Plessy case as well as the previous two cases. It is based upon, essentially, a reading of the Constitution that might provide some semblance of equality, but this is certainly still a white man's country, a white, man, white man's republic as the court uh, deems it. Now, the last thing I want to focus on is Justice John Marshall Harlan's dissenting opinion, which is one of the most brilliant uh, uh, opinions in the history of the court as it deals with race. And what Justice Harlan says here is uh, very interesting in, in the way that it's almost contradictory. I'm going to jump to page, uh, this is page 52, this is the second column, this is the second full paragraph, and he issues what is known as 
a, uh, the famous colorblind constitution theory here. And he says this, this is the second column, second full paragraph. The white race deems itself to be the dominant race in this country, and so it is in prestige, in achievements, in education, in wealth, and in power. So I doubt not it will not continue to be for all time. If it remains true to its great heritage and holds fast to the principles of constitutional liberty, but in the view of the Constitution, in the eyes of the law, there is in this country no superior, dominant, ruling class of citizens. There is no caste here. Our Constitution is colorblind and neither knows nor tolerates classes among its citizens. In respect of civil rights, all citizens are equal before the law. So, ta uh, so Justice Harlan does something very bizarre. He says the white race is superior uh, and probably will think of itself uh, superior for all time to come. But the Constitution is colorblind. It knows no race or class of citizens. There is no caste here. Um, and this is a vitally important dissenting opinion because even though a dissenting opinion doesn't have the force of law under our Constitution, the ideas that are on dissents sometimes come back years later to become a majority opinion. And it is clear by the 1950s that African Americans are using Justice Harlan's dissent to say, look, all we want is a colorblind society. We don't want to be discriminated on the basis of race. Furthermore, this notion of colorblindness will also come back, as we will see when we talk about affirmative action, because um, once you have an affirmative action policy that, that gives some type of preferential treatment on any kind of, uh, of, of characteristic, whether it's race, whether it's geography, whether it's economic um, inequality, you start to see people, at least conservatives, arguing, you know what, our Constitution should be colorblind and we should not treat people differently on the basis of race. So the notion of the colorblind Constitution is a, a brilliantly vital one as we go forward uh, in the next two weeks when we talk about race and the Constitution and the Supreme Court. So, in a nutshell, that's, that's about 100 years of Supreme Court history uh, as it relates to race in just about 30 minutes or so. But I want to be clear about what's happening here. First of all, in these three cases, you see the court um, favoring a white supremacist, a white republic reading of the Constitution, and I think that's clear in all of them. Secondly, though, you see the court reluctant to give the federal government the power to make equal uh, African Americans in the larger context of American society, and I think that's just as important. What role does the federal government have to get rid of discrimination? The Reconstruction period, which was extraordinary, tried to really do that. It tried to equalize African Americans in our uh, nation for the very first time, and it failed, and it only lasted a very short period of time. But what the court does in 1883 with the civil rights cases and in Plessy in 1896 is to say the federal government has gone too far to try to make African Americans equal, and so you have to step back. So with Plessy, we have the codification of what we know is separate but equal, a very bizarre reading of the 14th Amendment, which says that even though the, the amendment says equal protection of the laws, uh, separate but equal is constitutional. And this reading of the Constitution will essentially hold sway as we move into the civil rights era, which I will talk about next time. We're going to talk about Brown v. Board of Education, and then we're going to get on to the affirmative action cases that are in your packet of reading as well. Okay, so I'm going to leave it there. Um, this is a lot. You might have to watch this uh, over as you look at the uh, PowerPoint presentation. As always, contact me if you have any questions or issues, um, but uh, I hope that this is clear, and we will see you again next week. Take care.